Dragons in the Waters by Madeline Lengel. Three, the word Umar. <clears throat> Captain Van Leyden had teenage children of his own at home in Amsterdam, and he enjoyed the presence of the three young ones on his ship. After breakfast the next day, which pleased and astonished Simon by consisting of platters of sliced Gouda cheese, sausage, salt herring, freshly baked rolls, honey, jam, peanut butter, and boiled eggs, the captain gave them a grand tour of the Orion, introducing them to the crew, and then took them up on the bridge. You may come whenever you wish, he told them, except when the pilot is coming aboard. Consider this to be your ship. I can see that you are careful young persons. He instructed them in detail on the use of each of the vast array of instruments, and then showed them his radar machine, of which he was obviously proud. You see, he explained, it is not only blips around... It not only blips around at various distances, ten miles from shore, five miles from shore, and so forth, but look, now you see a photographic representation of sea and shore at various distances. Not, not now, of course, all, you see is, all we see is water, but after lunch we'll be able to see Cuba from the starboard side, and if you wish to come and look at it through the radar machine, you may. Oh, we do wish, Polly said. Thank you, Captain. Tomorrow, I will have the chief engineer, Olaf Costa, take, take you all over the engine room. It will be hot and dirty, so please dress accordingly. We will. You are amused? He asked them several times. We're having a marvelous time, Polly assured them. You're not bored? She stretched with enjoyment. I've never been on, I've never been bored in my life, and certainly I couldn't be bored on the Orion. When is the hearse, go where is the hearse going? To Caracas. What about the bullet hole in the windshield? It was sold at what you would call bargain price. And all the big boxes and cases? They contain mostly equipment for oil fields, refineries. The Orion carries almost everything, doesn't she, Captain? We are an all purpose we are an all purpose ship. You know that list of cargo on the table in the salon? For the information of the passengers. John Tenswick made the translation. Maybe sometimes his English is a little peculiar. Peculiar? Well, it says five boxes reefers. What are the reefers, Captain? Polly was simply curious. She did not think for a moment that the little ship was carrying marijuana. The captain looked at her in, refer in surprise. Refrigerators, Miss Polly. They are expensive in Caracas and not as large as American refrigerators. Or refrigerators, Miss Polly. They are expensive in Caracas and not as large as American refrigerators. If one is successful, one has an American car or Mercedes and one has an American refrigerator. Simon and Charles were looking at each other with laughter in their eyes, but all three of them kept polite and straight faces. Polly said, I see, thank you. And all the grain down in the hold? That goes to various places, Port of Dragons, for one. We should see the coasts of Colombia and Venezuela by Friday evening. Three more days. Polly looked across the vast expanse of water. That'll be exciting, but it's even more exciting to be in a small ship in the middle of the ocean and to see no land at all, almost as though we were like Noah, the captain said dryly. Noah, I assure you, was very happy to see land. After lunch, the three children went to Simon's place in the prow of the ship. The adult passengers had retired to their cabins for a siesta. On the promenade level, two young sailors were swabbing down the deck. Others were running up and down the ladders, carrying ropes, buckets. On the boat deck, a young sailor was painting the white rail, while another was polishing the brasses. The sailors smiled or waved to the children while continuing about their business. In the prow, the wind was still chill, and they were well bundled up. Ahead of them into starboard was a shadow of land. Cuba, Polly said, but I don't think we're going to get anywhere near enough to get an idea of what Cuba's like. I wish we could see it better. Geraldo said we'll be close enough to see something on the radar by mid-afternoon. Simon looked at Cuba, which revealed nothing, and then down at the water, which was a deep, dark blue streaked with white caps. He braced his feet against the gentle rolling of the ship. Around the prow, the water looked like fluid marble, and he thought it was one of the most beautiful things he had ever seen. Hey, look, y'all! Liquid marble! Sort of the way rock must have been when the earth was being formed. Only that was boiling hot and this is cold, he shivered. Geraldo had given him, or Geraldo had given him 
an extra blanket in place of a coat, and he pulled it more tightly around him and sat on a crate of oil well machinery in the lee of the wind. It occurs to me, he said in his old-fashioned way, that I answered a lot of questions last night, and there are some questions I would like to ask you. Charles perched in his favorite position on another crate. Ask ahead. Polly sat on the deck between the two boys. We ought to have a name for our place. Simon's face lit up. So we should. What? Let's each think about it till after dinner, and then tell each other what we've come up with, and we can decide which name is best. What do you want to ask us, Simon? How come you two are going to Venezuela with your father and leaving your mother and everybody else behind? Charles stared up at the sky, watching the movement of the clouds, and left Polly to answer. Well, you know Daddy's a marine biologist, and we used to live on Gaia Island off the south coast of Portugal, and now we're living in Venice Island. Yes. Well, this isn't for general information, Simon. As a matter of fact, you might call it classified, but Charles and I decided last night that we could trust you. Thank you. Simon bowed with grave formality. The Venezuelan government asked Daddy if he would come spend a few weeks at Dragon Lake and study what's happening to the lake. It's a big source of oil, and you know how important oil is right now. Well, no, I didn't. What do you and Aunt Leonis heat your house by? Firewood. Oh, well, oil is important. People thought it would sort of keep spouting out of the earth forever and ever, and suddenly there's not enough, and Americans are used to having more than enough. So places that have oil are important, but at Dragon Lake, the oil wells are in the lake, the way they are in Lake Maracaibo, and in Dragon Lake, the fish and other marine life are dying, and if they can't find out what's causing it, Dragon Lake is going to be a dead sea. Some people are saying that the dragon has been angered by the oil wells, and is drinking the oil, and maybe that's just a way of saying that if we don't take care of the earth, the earth is going to rebel. Anyhow, when the Venezuelan government asked Daddy, he decided he'd go and take Charles and me out of school for a month and bring us with him. The reason that it's all top secret is that the oil companies might get upset, so you won't say anything? Of course not. Daddy's, purpose, Daddy's purportedly going to get some unusual specimens of marine life, and of course he'll do that too, and Charles and I can help him there. He and mother say that the trip and the working and working with daddy that way is an education in itself for Charles and me. And fortunately, the principal of our school agreed and Charles and I are due a proper vacation, aren't we, Charles? Definitely. You two are the eldest? Charles' face lit up with a smile which began with a quick which began with a quirk at the corners of his lips and spread all over his face, focusing in the deep blue of his eyes, the same Gentian color as his father's. We have five brothers and sisters. Well, you saw them in Savannah, all younger than we are. If you're used to being with Aunt Leonis, we are usually surrounded by infants because we're the eldest. We do try to help out, Polly added. It would be impossible for Mother otherwise, though she was the one who thought of having us go along with Daddy. Say, Simon, what about your cousin Forsythe? And why didn't you think maybe he... And why didn't you think maybe he was an imposter? Charles looked sharply at Polly, but she was looking at Simon. Simon answered, He had all kinds of credentials, but I don't think Aunt Le Leonis would have just accepted them if he didn't have the fair nose and chin. If you had looked at him, and then at some of the old de daguerreotypes Aunt Leonis kept because they weren't saluable, because they weren't saluable, you know he was kin. He has a swarthy complexion, but otherwise he looks like the fairs. You don't look like him, not one bit. You're as blonde as Jan, Zendu as Jan Tenzwick. My hair comes from the Rainiers, my father's family. Did Aunt Leonis open her arms and embrace Cousin Forsythe, like the long-lost son and so forth? Not exactly. She wasn't entirely happy about Cousin Forsythe because, because he comes from a branch of the family which collaborated after the war. Way back with the Nazis? No, no, with the carpetbaggers. Simon, what war are you talking about? The war between the states, Simon looked surprised. Charles and Polly exchanged glances. Polly said gently, Simon, there have been several wars since then. When you said the war, you sounded as though it were the only war. Maybe its effects are still felt more at Pharaoh than the other wars. But slavery was bad. Sure, it was bad, 
But mostly that wasn't what the war was about. Anyhow, we didn't have slaves at Pharaoh. You sound as though you'd been there. Why didn't you have slaves? Quentin Farr. After all, he spent a long time with Bolivar fighting for freedom. He could hardly have slaves on his own plantation. It was what might be called a a commune today. Everybody worked together, black and white. All the slaves were given their freedom by Quentin Fair when he built Pharaoh. And then they could choose whether to stay as part of the family or to go. And it was the same way in my father's family, the Rainiers. Their plantation was called Nyssa, and there weren't any slaves there either. You're telling us that this was typical, Simon? Or you're not telling us that this was typical, Simon. I know it wasn't typical, but it's the way it was for the Fares and the Rainiers. And that's where I come from. And after the war, everybody was poor, poor unto starvation. Polly continued to probe. If you didn't have any slaves and everybody worked together, why was everybody so poor? You forget. We were in an occupied territory, like Israel in the time of Christ, or Norway with the Nazis. Pharaoh wasn't burned the way Nyssa was. The Yankee officers took it the Yankee officers took it over for their headquarters. So the house was saved, but they burned the fields and then they salted them. It took years before the land would yield any crops. If you've lived off the land by dint of very hard work on everybody's part, and the land is destroyed, then things aren't easy for anybody. Oh, Polly said in a chastised way, that's something I hadn't realized. Every time I think I know it all, I get taken down a peg, and I guess that's a good thing. What about Cousin Forsythe's family? They had money and food and clothes and luxuries, and people didn't unless they collaborated with the carpetbaggers. You see why Aunt Leonis wasn't entirely happy about him. Maybe it was like collaborating with the Nazis. But the carpetbaggers weren't Nazis. They were us, Polly stopped and said. Maybe that's the point. Oh, dear. So what happened with Cousin Forsythe's family? They moved up north and then out west, and we lost track of them until the evening Cousin Forsythe knocked on our door. And it was only a month ago he came? Yes, he stayed in Charleston at the Fort Sumter. Well, all arrangements were being made, calls to Caracas and our booking on the Orion and everything. And all that month, Aunt Leonis tried to make me speak only Spanish. Have you lived with her all your life, Polly asked. Simon's face hardened. And he looked older than his thirteen. He looked older than thirteen, but his voice was calm. I've known her all my life, and I've been in and out of Pharaoh, but I've only lived with her all the time for five years, since my parents died. Oh, Simon! Polly reached out to touch him gently on the arm. I'm so sorry. Simon nodded gravely. Was it an accident? Well, it seemed to me it was a sort of a cosmic one. My mother was dying of cancer, and six months before she died, my father, my father had a heart attack. He died. So mother and I moved in with Aunt Leonis, and she nursed mother until she died. His voice was stiff and dry. Polly's chest tightened in sudden panic. She thought she would not be able to bear it if anything happened to her parents. Charleston and Benicide Island seemed more than a day away by sea, and suddenly she missed her mother and her younger brothers and sisters so badly that it hurt. If only she could run to a telephone and hear their voices, be reassured of their being. But the telephone was one of the aspects of civilization that Dr. O'Keefe had said he would be pleased to do without for a while. No emergency, please, Polly pleaded silently. Don't let there be any emergency. Simon's color came back to his cheeks. Not everybody would have an Aunt Leonis to take over. I'm lucky. Polly shook herself, shedding ugly thoughts like water. Let's go to the promenade deck and see what the grown-ups are doing. She led the way, and as they passed the door to the cabin with the portrait, she tried the handle. It did not move under the pressure of her hand. Oh, well, I suppose it would be locked. But if it's so heavily crated and all... It's a nice portrait, Simon too tried the door. Bolivar looks handsome, and you can actually see energy in his expression, and a sort of excitement. He looks the way a great hero ought to look, Polly pushed the handle of the bathroom door, which opened under her pressure, to reveal a long, deep tub almost the size of her bunk. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I'll have a gorgeous soak this evening. I don't care if I never see a shower. I love to wallow in a hot tub. In Gaia, we had the whole ocean for a tub most of the year round, but it's been much too cold at Benicide Island for for swimming. On the promenade deck, Geraldo had put out some games for the passengers, a set of rings to toss, 
and pucks for shuffleboard, Dr. Wordsworth and Dr. Eisenstein wrapped in blankets, their heads swathed in scarves, occupied two of the deck chairs. Polly led the way out the door, across the back of the deck, and then in the door up to the and then in the door to the starboard passage. I have a hunch our two professors don't care too much don't care much for the companionship of children. You can't have secrets very easily on freighters, and I heard them talking about us after breakfast. She is, she assumed Dr. Wordsworth's voice, strong, pedantic, and with a faint trace of an accent. What do you make of those children? Her voice changed to Dr. Eisenstein's, gentler than Dr. Wordsworth, which a touch with a touch of Boston. They're moderately polite, which is Refresh, which is a refreshing change, and they don't have the usual moronic look of voc- lack of vocabulary and the mumbling speech of the affluent American young. And Dr. Wordsworth said, at least they're keeping out of our hair. And Dr. Eisenstein said, I wish you'd stop reminding me how gorgeous your hair is, and changed the subject. Simon and Charles laughed at her accurate mimicry of the two women. They passed Mr. Theo's single cabin and came to Polly's. She ushered them in. I'm hardly affluent, Simon said. Charles climbed up onto the foot of the bunk. I know you must be poor as far as money goes, but you're not like most poor people in any other way. Most poor people aren't like Aunt Leonis. We're rich in education, and we're rich in tradition. We're very lucky, Charles nodded. I don't think we're affluent either. We're not poor or anything, but marine biologists aren't apt to make millions, and Daddy's always having to buy expensive equipment. The Smiths like us, by the way. Mrs. Smith keeps trying to pat me on the head and tell me what a nice little boy I am and that they have a great-grandson in San Jose who's very much like me. She told me, You're so courteous and considerate, not like a little American boy at all. I hate that, Polly said vehemently. We're completely American, and anyhow, it implies that all American kids are rich slobs, and that's not true. Simon, leaning against the chest of drawers, agreed gravely. There are quite a few of us poor slobs, too. Polly sat on the small space of floor between the bed and chest, leaning against the bed. Tell us more about you and Aunt Leonis. Why are you so poor as far as money goes? I'm not exactly sure. When my parents were alive, I guess we were sort of like you, not rich, not poor, but my father had a newspaper and his business was all in his head. And when he died, there just wasn't anything left over because Mother's illness had already cost so much. Aunt Leonis says that that only the very rich and the very poor can afford to be ill. I guess being poor is a lot harder on her than it is on me, because she grew up in the big house at Pharaoh, and she's the one who's gone from from riches to rags. He pushed the fisherman's cap up on his head. Everybody's so nice on this ship, he said, changing the subject. The captain letting us watch him on the bridge, and Geraldo giving me this cap and all. It's almost worth having to sell the Bolivar portrait. Not quite, but almost, he swung around and saw Polly's icon. What's that? It's St. George and the Dragon. I take it with me wherever I go. St. George looks so kind, even while he's being fierce with the dragon. Aunt Leonis and I have a dragon, a make-believe one, but he's a good dragon and protects Pharaoh and our garden. Hey, y'all, that's what we call our place, the Dragon's Lair. He looked so delighted that Polly and Charles immediately agreed that the Dragon's Lair was a perfect name. Hey, y'all, that's what we can call our place, the dragon's lair. Because there are good dragons. I mean, because there are good dragons, like Aunt Leonis is in mine. He eats nothing but spinach moss, and he sleeps curled around one of the live oak trees. And whenever there's danger, he sprouts fire. He spouts fire. Charles asked unexpectedly, did he spout fire when Cousin Forsyth came? Simon looked uncomfortable. Why would Cousin Forsyth be dangerous? I don't know, Charles said flatly. Even the dragon couldn't keep Aunt Leonis from having to sell the portrait. If it hadn't been for Cousin Forsyth, it would have been someone else. And Aunt Leonis says that if it had to go, she'd be gl- she's glad it's going back to Venezuela where it came from. She says that things know where they belong and maybe the time had come for the portrait to return to its native land. Polly scrambled up from the floor. We've got St. George with us on the Orion, and he'll take care of us if we encounter any dragons that aren't as nice as yours. She stretched and yawned. I think I'll take my bath now before dinner. Come along and talk to me while it runs, and maybe the cabin with the portrait will be unlocked. I'd like at least to see the case. 
Who would have unlocked the cabin door in the last 15 minutes? Charles asked. The boys, tra- the boys trailed after her, out the door to the aft deck, behind the deck, behind the deck chairs of the two professors and in through the door to the port passage. Polly opened the door to the bathroom and leaned over the tub to turn on the taps, then raised her fingers to her lips. Simon started to speak, but Polly turned to him. Shh, or shush. There were voices coming from the cabin next to the tub room, the cabin with the portrait. A heavily accented voice said, It's all the words, Omar. Nonsense, you are mistaken. It was Cousin Forsyth's voice. But you are spying again. I do not spy, but the word Umar I saw. Impossible. You remember when you were bringing the portrait to the cabin? There was a loose board which I hammered back into place. That's when I saw it. Umar. So, a random grouping of letters. It means nothing. You think that? Of course. Totally unimportant. The voices stopped. Polly bent back over the tub and turned on both taps full force. We eavesdropped, Simon said. We listened. Aunt Leona says. Polly held her hands under the flow of water, adjusting the taps until the water suited her. Your Aunt Leonis is absolutely right for her world, but this isn't Aunt Leonis's world. What do you mean? Simon, this is the end of the 20th century. Things are falling apart. The center doesn't hold. We don't have time for, for courtliness and the finer niceties of courtesy. And, if I, and I've learned the hard way. And I've, and I've learned that the hard way. Does Umar mean anything to you? No. Is there something written on the back of the portrait? I don't know. I never looked. Only the portrait, only at the portrait itself. There was never any reason to turn it around. That was Cousin Forsyth, we heard. Yes. And the man with him had a Dutch accent. Who helped him with the portrait yesterday? I don't know. It was where we were getting dry after the forklift. Charles sat down on the small white stool, which was the only piece of furniture in the tiny tub room. Don't make too big a thing of it, Paul. Am I? She looked fiercely at her brother. I don't know, Charles said. Darkness fell more quickly at Pharaoh for Aunt Leonidas than it did for Simon at sea. In the last of the light, she sat on her small, sagging front porch. Simon had kept it from tumbling down altogether and read her ancestors' journals. Her heart was heavy, and she was not sure why. His was not an unusual story, a virile young man expending his energies in fighting for for the freedom of a beleaguered, overtaxed country could hardly be expected to celebrate. Wherever foreigners fight in a strange land, they leave their foreign seed and leave it probably more casual than did Quentin Farr. Quentin Fair. My son grows apace, wrote Quentin. Each time I manage to get to Dragon Lake, he seems to have doubled in size. Already he is walking, falling, picking himself up and walking again. Like his Indian cousins, he is learning to swim almost as quickly as he is learning to walk. I cannot pretend that he is not mine. I cannot forget Umara and our child. The Quistanos are not like any of the other natives I have met in my five years here. Not like any other Indians. Not like the white Creoles. Certainly not like the tragic imported Africans. They are not like anybody. Dragon Lake is another world. If I cannot bring my Umara and my son to England, and I cannot... Umara would not be Umara would not be welcomed, she would be insulted, and I would not have that. Then it seems to me when my work is done I must stay here, though I doubt if this battling of if this battling of the Royalists will be over before several more years. What is there to take me home to England? I have become used to this country and these people, and even this malaria with which I have been been bedridden for the past week. I will go back to Kent briefly. I owe my dearest mamma that much. And then I will set sail for the last time and make my home at Dragon Lake. If the Quistanos will have me, and Umara says they will. My fellow officers already think me mad. Simone is the only one who understands, and he only because he is my friend. And so then, this will be my final madness, and I feel cold and strange even when my heart rejoices. Miss Leonis, too, felt cold and strange, and there was no rejoicing in her heart. When Quentin wrote these words, he had not yet met. Ninian, the future toward which he looked with fear and joy, was not the future which was to come. He did not know 
as Leonis did at the end of the story. Or was it the end? Did such stories end with the death of the protagonist? Or were there future scenes to be acted out before the curtain could fall? It was too dark to read, and with the setting of the sun, the shadows moved in coldly. In her warm coat, the old woman shivered and went indoors to light the fire, followed by Boz, who nudged at her hand. She moved heavily, unable to throw off the thought that Quentin Farr's dreams, or that Quentin Farr's drama, was being continued through Simon Bolivar, Quentin Farr Rainier, and that Simon was in danger. Simon had accustomed himself to Cousin Forsyth's snoring. To cousin Simon, who had accustomed himself to Cousin Forsyth's snoring, slept. He dreamed that he and Doctor Eisenstein were carrying the Bolivar portrait along the edge of a deep lake. They were running, stumbling over hummocks and tussocks because a dragon was after the portrait. Dr. Eisenstein turned to, into Mr. Theo, who put the portrait down, put two fingers in his mouth, and whistled loudly. The dragon came hurrying to him, puffing and panting in eagerness, and then Simon and Mr. Theo climbed onto the dragon, who soared into the sky. It was a nice dream. It had started out to be a nightmare, and then it turned into fun. In his sleep, Simon th- sighed peacefully. And we'll pause there.